I'd like to introduce you to the third session, which is Maritime Policy and Law. We have quite a few speakers um, in this session. Uh, a few speakers very kindly uh, joined us um, in the last few days, which is great because it, it really adds to what we're, we're trying to put across here. Um, so I'll abbreviate um, the, the bios. You all have bios in front of you. I will print out a few more uh, a little bit later. So anyone who doesn't have them, I'll make sure you do by the end of the day. Um, so our first speaker in this session is Miakos uh, Gurigidis. I'm afraid the curtains have come down again for you. Um, I can look if you prefer the Lord Sorry. Okay. He is going to talk about HMS Aphrodite, Cyprus and the Royal Navy. Miakos uh, has come from the University of Hertfordshire. He is um, a senior lecturer and non-practicing solicitor uh, within the School of Law. Thank you, Miakos. Thank you for that very warm introduction and could I add my uh, thanks to the organisers for inviting me today and for organising this, this conference. Uh, I have to first of all acknowledge that my knowledge of the Royal Navy is relatively limited. I've spent much of my uh, academic career studying uh, the, the Royal Air Force and its involvement in Cyprus. So this uh, presentation represents, if I may use uh, the expression, the offcuts of uh, my primary research strands. HMS Aphrodite was the name given by the Royal Navy to its infrastructure on the then Crown Colony of Cyprus during the mid-1950s. As you can see from the name of this ship, uh, the, the Royal Navy has an affinity with uh, classical uh, terminology and uh, the use of the phrase HMS Aphrodite was very much in that, uh, that naval tradition. I'd like to do, uh, in 12 minutes, uh, four things. First of all, draw attention to the original uh, maritime flavoured rationale for the British acquisition of Cyprus in 1878 that wasn't really properly fulfilled after 1878. Secondly, I'd like to highlight the existence of the Royal Naval infrastructure of the <coughs> island of Cyprus as laid down in the 1960 Treaty of Establishment. Thirdly, I want to emphasise the renewed naval significance of the Port of Limassol in particular, but uh, the island of Cyprus as a whole in the post 9-11 expeditionary era. And fourthly, I'd like to close with some thoughts as to where the, uh, the future of the United Kingdom's relationship with uh, the Republic of Cyprus may lie. Let me begin, therefore, by taking you back to 1878. And it's quite interesting to observe the comments of the then British Prime Minister, uh, the Earl of Beaconsfield, or otherwise known as Benjamin Disraeli. In the House of uh, Lords, he claimed that Cyprus will be most important as a place of arms, as affording a capacious harbour for our Navy, and unlimited convenience for the quartering of Her Majesty's forces. Be that as it may, the port of Famagusta was not deep enough for the purposes of uh, the Royal Navy. And the British government was short of money, as it is today. And they chose not to spend the necessary funds on deepening the port of Famagusta. Furthermore, in 1882, the British acquired, effectively acquired Egypt. So they had alternative uh, naval bases in the Eastern Mediterranean. And Cyprus effect effectively became a backwater of empire and of limited use to the Royal Navy. During the uh, Cold War era, as the troubles with the, the islanders uh, unfolded in the late 40s and 1950s, Cyprus assumed critical importance in support of, of air power and the Royal Air Force in particular. And, as you're all aware, the British never really left Cyprus in 1960. The Republic of Cyprus was established. It wasn't given independence. It was established uh, under the Treaty of Establishment. And under the terms of the, the Treaty of Establishment, the United Kingdom reserved various rights. Two sovereign base areas, both on the coast of the island of Cyprus. And the naval infrastructure is partly to be found uh, in the, the two sovereign base areas. But it's terribly important for us to appreciate that the, the Royal Navy's interests on the island go beyond 
the sovereign base areas. As I'll, I'll illustrate in a moment or two, the uh, Royal Navy in, under the 1960 treaty retained certain sites at the port of Famagusta and on other uh, parts of the coast of the island and on the interior, of course. They also retained certain training grounds, initially uh, at Agamas and in one or two other places. And no, no less importantly, the Royal Navy reserved the right to make use of the ports of the Republic of Cyprus. So the 1960 Treaty of Establishment is a classic example of neo-colonialism. The British left, but didn't leave. And uh, they're still there today. And as George Orwell said, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And the Treaty of Establishment, as we all know, is an unequal uh, treaty loaded in favour of the, uh, the outgoing colonial power. <coughs> this is HMS Arethusa within the Akrotiri sovereign base area. And this is the first of the four limbs of the British uh, naval infrastructure on the island, the sovereign base areas. As part of that, it's very important to observe that the Royal Navy has its own air power and naval air power occasionally makes use of RAF Akrotiri and indeed the airspace of the Republic of Cyprus. And this is an unintended byproduct of neo-colonialism. The coastline around much of the sovereign base areas is pristine. It hasn't been built up in the way that uh, Ayanaba, for example, has been built up. The, we've all seen the view from Kuriam Theatre that is within the sovereign base areas. It's ironic sometimes that colonialism or neo-colonialism produces some good. And no doubt there's shrapnel dotted around the bits that have been bombed, but be that as it may, the coastline is pristine by and large. And that image uh, encapsulates that point rather well, I hope. The uh, Royal Navy and the Royal Marines make use of the, uh, the sovereign base areas and the, the sea for uh, amphibious training exercises. These were the training exercises conducted uh, shortly before the uh, US-led invasion of Iraq in March 2003. And all of the images I should say that I'm, I'm showing to you today are, are constitute crown copyright material which I'm reproducing uh, with the kind permission of, of the controller of Her Majesty's station office. So these are all crown copyright images which were released at the, at the time of uh, the exercises and are in the public today. I mentioned the retained site. This was uh, the NAFI station at uh, Famagusta, which was destroyed by the, it seems, the Turkish Air Force during the, the Turkish invasion of 1974. This is still a British retained site. And, and as the, the Minister of Defence puts it in, uh, in, in a written answer published uh, by the House of Commons, it's not used because it is in the Turkish occupied area. But the British still reserve the right to use uh, the facilities, the retained sites in Famagusta, and indeed they reserve the right to use the port of Famagusta. It's implicit uh, in British policy that that is the case, and the position is expressly laid out in the, the Treaty of Establishment. Of course, that is one reason why the United Kingdom has never recognised the, the so-called TRNC as a separate sovereign state. It's not in British strategic interests for such recognition to be conveyed. I want to now turn to the um, third, the penultimate part of, of my brief presentation. And, and what I'd like to do now is draw attention to the renewed strategic significance of the island of Cyprus as a whole in support of British expeditionary strategy. Since 1990, the United Kingdom's forces have participated in a number of major overseas expeditions. Those relating to Kuwait in 1990 to 91, those concerning Afghanistan since 2001, those relating to Iraq from 2003 uh, until uh, 2009, if memory serves me correctly. And we may now be seeing the unfolding of, of, of an operation in relation to Syria. Time will tell whether that comes to fruition. But these recent military deployments, particularly those relating to uh, Iraq in 2003, have hinged upon 
the use of Cyprus as a stepping stone, to use the phrase that cropped up in, in this morning's uh, 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 seminar, or this morning's uh, panel discussion. Cyprus is a stepping stone from the United Kingdom to Asia via the Suez Canal. And Cyprus has always been inextricably connected to the Suez Canal. It's the two go hand in hand. And according to media reports at the time of the deployment to Iraq, and this is a photograph taken in January 2003, uh, what passed through uh, Cyprus at the time constituted the biggest British warfighting task group deployment since the Falklands conflict of 1982. So Cyprus, even though the Cyprus government doesn't want to publicly admit this, Cyprus and I'm talking here about the sovereign base areas and the Republic, because some of these ships uh, made use of uh, the port of Limassol, as I understand it. The island of Cyprus is of pivotal importance to the expeditionary strategy of this country. It's important for the deployment of forces. It's, it's important for the maintenance of logistics and lines of communications once a deployment has begun. And, as we'll discover when the... Uh, drawdown, to use the MOD phrase, or the retreat, to use Laban's terminology, from Afghanistan begins. Cyprus is also important when there is a withdrawal of forces from, from overseas. And this Ministry of Defence map rather makes that point for me. How do you send armed forces from the United Kingdom to Iraq uh, or to Afghanistan? You only need to look at a map to appreciate that you can either do it by air through Akrodiri and through Egypt, unless the Syrians give information, which is unlikely, uh, or by sea through the Suez Canal via Cyprus. So this is this self-evident. The only change that has occurred, therefore, since the time of Alexander the Great is that the Suez Canal facilitates the, the passage of ships from the Mediterranean into the, the Red Sea and thereafter into the, uh, in, into the Gulf and so on. That's the only real change from antiquity, it's been the introduction of the, uh, the Suez Canal. And as uh, Benjamin Disraeli put it back in 1878, Cyprus is the key of Western Asia. But as I've already indicated, Egypt is the key hole. Now I've focused so far on combat operations, Deployments of the type we saw in, in Kuwait and in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But Cyprus also comes in handy, a phrase that my PhD supervisor Philip Toll planted in my mind. Cyprus also comes in handy whenever there is a major crisis requiring a humanitarian deployment of British forces and the extraction of British nationals from the, the war zone. And in two, the year 2006, we saw one of the largest ever British evacuation missions conducted uh, when the, um, the Israelis were um, engaged in, uh, locked in combat with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the Royal Navy sent ships to, to Lebanon to evacuate British uh, and other uh, EU nationals. And the port of Limassol came in, into its own as a, as a really important uh, staging post on the way back to the United Kingdom for these British nationals. It's very interesting, it's very interesting that if you study history, uh, you will discover that among the largest ever evacuations of British people in the uh, past uh, 80 years or so, at least four have taken place in the Eastern Mediterranean. Three, rather, have taken place in the Eastern Mediterranean. Greece in 1941, Cyprus itself in 1974, and Lebanon in 2006. The, the other huge evacuation took place from Dunkirk in 1940, and there are indeed Cypriot service personnel in Dunkirk in 1940. But three of the four largest evacuation operations involving British armed forces have taken place in the Eastern Mediterranean, and Cyprus has had at least a small part in, in all in all three. And that tells you something as to the strategic importance of Cyprus. So I'm now coming to a close uh, and I'm reminded of what Thucydides said in antiquity. Wars spring from unseen and generally insignificant causes 
the first outbreak of which is often an explosion of anger. And just look where Cyprus is situated. It's situated along one of the major sea lines of communication, which of course passes through the Suez Canal. It's in a reasonably close proximity to the Straits of Hormuz and the Gulf and other major uh, places of maritime significance. It's becoming increasingly encircled by Islamist regimes and countries which are becoming dominated by Islamist movements and by an Islamist culture which is being built up from the, the bottom, I regret to say. And um, Cyprus now, it seems, has natural gas uh, in its exclusive economic zone. And what history also shows, and what this FCO map, Foreign and Commonwealth Office map, underlines, is that there seems to be a close correlation between energy supplies and conflict. The Suez Crisis of 1956 illustrated that. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990 underlined that. And Turkey's saber-rattling over Cyprus today magnifies the, the, the risks that Cyprus faces. And now Cyprus has jumped into bed with Israel. So every one of Israel's enemies is now an enemy of Cyprus. And that brings me to my, my concluding thoughts. Uh, I've written extensively about the, the, the sovereign base areas. I, if there was a gold medal for brick bashing at the Olympic Games, I would be a strong candidate <laughs> for winning it. But having said all of that, uh, I, I, I would also suggest that it's time that the Republic of Cyprus enters into a fresh relationship with the United Kingdom. There is a clear British strategic and economic interest in Cyprus becoming a supplier of, and producer and a supplier of natural gas. We're running out of gas in this country, as you may have noticed in the media. And surely there is a British interest in providing a defence mechanism in support of the Republic of Cyprus. Surely the Republic of Cyprus should give serious consideration to entering into a treaty relationship, a new treaty relationship with the United Kingdom. So that, for example, the United Kingdom is under a legal obligation to provide intelligence to the Republic of Cyprus. So that the Royal Navy can spring to the defense of the Republic if there is um, an attack upon the natural gas infrastructure. I know there's a treaty of guarantee there, which it's not, now is not the time to discuss. but. If you're going to develop an offshore energy infrastructure in the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, and if you're simultaneously going to build up a land-based energy infrastructure, then surely there is a role for the United Kingdom and its armed forces to play a part in the, the defense of that infrastructure and in the broader security framework uh, of, of the Republic. Now, if, if Sir Humphrey from Yes Minister was here, he'd be pulling his hair out because I can imagine that my proposal, my suggestion will create a, a, a difficulties for the diplomats, but nonetheless, that's my view and I, I've put it there. But I'd like to just close with a more, a more optimistic note, that um, Cyprus is now in, in huge difficulty uh, with the financial crisis that, that we've seen uh, that befall the island. And something that really ought to happen as the future unfolds is, is that the, all of this military history, all of this rich um, history that we've seen portrayed today in some of the presentations that Tim and, and the others this morning have, have, have given to us, all of these should form part of what I would regard as a new outreach strategy with a view to bringing in tourists, with a view to... Uh, ch changing the perception of Cyprus by outsiders. Outsiders should really regard Cyprus, to use Mr. Ikeshi's phrase earlier, as an open museum. It's a museum where, where people can go and learn about the history of humanity. But I would say one other thing, the Re and the Republic of Cyprus will hopefully take, take this seriously. The Republic of Cyprus should portray itself as the easterly outpost of Western liberal democracy as a bulwark against Islamism, and as a bastion for the rule of law. Fresh thinking is needed, and the United Kingdom and the Republic of Cyprus should think seriously about how they can not necessarily put the past to one side, but 
look to the future and build a more modern, cooperative and friendly relationship that's based on equality rather than superiority and inferiority as occurred in the past. I close on that thought. Thank you.